Hi everybody, my name is John McGuire. I'm a writing teacher and a longtime practitioner of journalism. I teach at the college level. I've written and edited for most of my life. And I'm here to give you a little discussion and lesson on the concept of readability. Readability is the word we use to describe a piece of writing that is easily understandable by the reader. Now, the best way to define readability is to talk about the opposite of readability. If I were to ask you what constitutes an unreadable piece of writing, you would have no problem telling me that it's boring, vague, confusing, can't tell what's going on, have to reread it to see what's happening. So that's the quality of an unreadable piece of writing. So the quality of a readable piece of writing is the opposite, which is it's instantly clear it's interesting. You never have to reread it to see what's going on. And um, it leaves you more alert. Instead of leaving you snoozing at the end, it leaves you kind of happier with the world. You've learned something interesting. Now, you may assume that it takes special talent or genius to be a really readable writer. That if what you write is kind of confusing and boring, then it's just because you don't have the talent and other people do. This is a, a, an assumption that many uh, students have and they're mistaken. The truth of the matter is readability is a skill that you can learn. It doesn't mean that everything you write is going to be readable the first time out, but it means that even if you write a kind of mediocre, boring attempt on your first draft, you can revise it so it's more readable. You do, have, however, have to know how it's done. So I'm here, and hopefully you're going to give me your full attention to show you what readability is about. So there was a great thinker, researcher in the 1940s at Columbia University in New York City who did a lot of work on readability and discovered that you could actually measure it. His name was Rudolf Flesch, and if you use Microsoft Word at the end of Rudolf, at the end of Microsoft Word, you will sometimes do a spell check and discover that you have readability statistics and you will see something called the Flesch readability score. That is a reference to Rudolf Flesch, the granddaddy of readability studies. So I'm going to present to you today a synthesis of what Rudolf Flesch came up with and what I have come up with in the last 25 years of teaching writing in the Boston area at various Boston colleges. My website, as you can see here, by the way, is readablewriting.com. So let's see what goes into readability. Here we have a poster with five sliders on it. I'm going to move all these sliders down to the bottom and we'll proceed to discuss them. Now this slider poster in some ways is like a piece of electronic equipment um, where an equalizer. Sometimes uh, you will have uh, want to alter the sound of a, of a piece of music and you will move the equalizer sliders to change the sound. So that's the analogy here. This is like an equalizer to adjust the quality, not of sound, but of what you wrote. So readability basically is achieved by altering any one of these five variables. Now, unreadable writing, which I talked about, which we all know about, the kind that puts you to sleep and that's hard work and that's a hard slog and is boring, that's represented by these variables across the bottom. So, as you might be able to tell from a poster like this, if this is bad writing at the bottom, then across the top is what constitutes good writing. So let's go into what constitutes bad writing. A really bad piece of writing will have a very long average sentence. The average sentence length will be 30 or more. Um, that's a very old-fashioned style that uses really long sentences, and they're hard to process by today's readers. A really bad style will be full of abstract words. An abstract word is an idea word. It often ends with I-O-N. Um, 
and it takes a lot of effort to uh, understand idea words and when there's a whole cluster of them, a lot of them all in one space, the reading gets hard. In terms of the verbs in the sentences, and I hope you know your verbs well, in terms of the verbs in the sentences, is, are, was, and were are extremely weak. Passive verbs are weak. And this is another sign of unreadable writing. And a fourth sign of really difficult to read writing is there are no people in it. We human beings are a gregarious uh, species. We grow up in families. We have friends and co-workers and relatives. And we love to see people. If somebody produces a piece of writing with no people in it, then we're going to feel excluded. It's not going to feel very human. Economics, sociology, uh, often hard sciences have no people in them. Finally, we come to the issue of how long are the syllables in this particular piece of writing we're looking at. Very readable writing has a lot of one-syllable words. Difficult writing has a lot of multisyllabics. Uh, words that are three, four, and five syllables. They sound very fancy, you sound very educated when you use them, but cluster them together in a passage and they make it very hard to read. So we've just reviewed bad writing, let's talk about good writing. So good writing, by contrast, good writing has an average sentence length, counted in words per sentence, of about 15 to 17 words. Research and studies have proven this, okay? Good writing has a fair amount of concreteness in it, meaning physical things you can drop on your foot. Um, we are always interested in the three-dimensional world, and if you give the reader something to see that he can touch, you know, uh, it wakes him up. Good writing also has a lot of active verbs. Now, active verbs like uh, run, say, jump, dance, leap, move, think, believe. All of these active verbs require an actor to do the action and we can see things happening in our head. It's almost like a Walt Disney movie when you have a, an active verb passage. Really readable writing has at least some people in it. Now how do we put people into a piece of writing? We put in some names. How about Harry Potter? There's a good name. So if we write a passage and this, a guy in there named Harry Potter, we have put a person into our writing. The name tells us that. And if we have Harry Potter speak and quote him directly using quotation marks, he seems even more vivid, feels even more human. Finally, really good and readable writing that is not a burden on the reader tends to use short words. Now, there's nothing wrong with using short words. In fact, many great writers have said short words are to be preferred. My favorite guy is Winston Churchill, and he's the one who said, never use a long word when there's a short one that will do the trick. Now, occasionally you have to use long words, but frequently there's a short word that will do the trick. I'll give you an example. Conversation. That's a four-syllable word, okay? There's a one-syllable word that will do the trick, and that's the word talk. Every time you use a word like talk instead of a word like conversation, you are lightening uh, the load on the reader. You're making it easier for the reader to follow you. So that's the essence of readability. Now, if you have produced something that's not re that readable on the first draft, if you're uninstructed, you may sort of despair. This happens a lot to freshmen. They say, uh, Mr. McGuire, my first draft is not that good. What am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. I don't think I'm ever going to be a writer. And I tell them, all you need to do is get control of your key variables. So let me ask you, Jackie, in this little essay you did about the housing crisis of 2008, are there any really long sentences in there? And Jackie, in one of our coaching sessions, may go through and circle three or four long sentences, and I'll say, there's your first place to go to work, Jackie. Break those long sentences in half. As soon as you do that, you make your writing more readable by altering this variable and shortening your average sentence length. I might then also say, 
Jackie, this is about the housing crisis. Do you know anybody who went through this? Because I don't see any people in here in this essay. If she says, my uncle Leonard went through it, he actually, he did, it was very sad. Uh, he and his wife Marlene lost their house and they had to go live in an apartment, you know. So I say to Jackie, look, Uncle Leonard and his wife Marlene are people. And it's very important to put people in, no matter how abstract the topic you're dealing with, like the housing crisis. And when you think about it, that's enormously abstract. But even a huge abstraction like the national housing crisis of 2008, when you drill down and you climb down into reality, in fact, there are individuals who are being affected by it. So your job as a writer is to put them in. The way you do it is by naming people. So that's how I would coach a freshman named Jackie James into editing her own material. I would remind her that these five variables that are all that counts with regard to being readable. Okay? I would say, don't worry about your semicolons. Your commas are probably not much of a problem unless you've made a run-on sentence. Do not worry about fancy words. In fact, fancy words are your enemy. Worry about these five things. And students like Jackie have found that this advice works. It, it, this chart and these five variables give you something to do. But it's not only freshmen who need to make their uh, writing more readable, it's everybody. Um, for instance, higher up the scale, uh, in graduate school, higher up the scale in graduate school, you might have um, a postdoctoral researcher who is putting together a uh, proposal for the NIH. And this proposal is very important. He may be trying to get $75,000 to support him for the next couple of years. He really needs to write. He's more or less writing for his life. We'll call him Peter Patel. So if I looked at Peter's uh, first page on his NIH proposal, I might see that it's not readable. In fact, his thesis advisor might say, Peter, you know, it's too vague, you know, or it's too wordy, uh, or it's too dry. Those are the words that people use when they're telling you your writing is not up to snuff. Vague, confusing, wordy, or dry. So when you hear somebody saying that to you, you know, it's time to fix your, uh, fix your uh, paper, you know, time to up your game. So when Peter Patel heard his advisor saying your stuff is too wordy and dry, he went in and looked at the first page, the most important page, and he discovered that he had five sentences that averaged 45 words or higher. So he immediately knew that those sentences needed to be shortened. He went in one sentence at a time, broke them up. In some cases, he struck words out. But in other cases, he just would take a 45-word sentence and break it into approximately a 22 and a 23-word sentence, put a period in the middle. And he has shortened the average sentence length, thereby increasing the readability. An interesting side note here for people who uh, are biology fans, the reader basically takes a breath when he hits a period. When the reader hits a period, the reader takes a pause, deep breath. So what happens when you take a deep breath? Your brain gets more oxygenated. And when your brain has more oxygen, you then actually wake up. So in fact, the more periods there are in your writing, the more oxygen you're giving your reader to make use of as he or she is paying attention to you. That's one of the ways to come to value periods more than you currently do. Anyway, Peter Patel, the graduate student and postdoc, also noticed that a lot of his verbs were passive verbs. He had sentences like, it has been observed in our laboratory, or these results have been reported elsewhere. And he noticed that those are passive verbs, and he thought, I can flip these around and have these sentences have actors. So he revo revised those sentences and said, we discovered this in our laboratory, or these results, um, or rather, uh, so-and-so's laboratory in Princeton has reported these other results. He turned as many verbs as he could around into being active verbs, with actors doing the action. As soon as he did this, he started to make things easier for the reader. So the, the understory or the subtext of this particular diagram is that while you're trying to achieve readability, 
and total clarity and liveliness for the reader, what you need to do is sort of go down into the sub-basement of what you were saying and adjust things in the basement. Adjust things that you didn't realize had that much of an effect. But they do have an effect. Um, so, as I said, the writing style that is required for, say, a, uh, a researcher is different from the writing style required for a freshman. A researcher, for instance, may have to use multisyllabics because it's a technical uh, subject he's writing about. He may not be able to get rid of all of them. But what this diagram tells you is that you don't have to get rid of all of these things. You just have to diminish their weight. So um, no matter how complicated the technical subject and how much it requires long words, you can always go through and say, I will going to use the minimum number of long words that I need. No more than I need, only the minimum number. And when possible, I'm going to use one syllable words or two syllable words. Uh, the reader is going to really thank you for this. Now, this is basic doctrine that professional editors and science writers have used for a long time. Um, people working for national magazines and so on. I'm putting in front of you here, in front of you college students here, because you too can learn to think like this. Now, you may say to yourself, how come I never noticed this before? And there's several reasons. One of them is, is that you have been taught to write mostly by English teachers in high school, not by professional writers and editors. English teachers are interested in your displaying those big vocabulary words. What they've been trying to get you to do all through high school is to use bigger and bigger words, because in their score sheet, the more you can use the big words, the more educated you are. Those teachers did not notice that if you keep on piling long words into your writing, you achieve the opposite effect. You don't look educated. You begin to look like a clumsy person trying to be educated. So we don't need to blame your high school teacher. She was doing the best she could. But now that you're in college or beyond, you are uh, walking to a different drummer. You have a higher standard. Now you're only going to use the big words when it's really crucial. Otherwise, you're going to go for the small ones. And that's what first class writers have done all the time. As I said, that was Winston Churchill's philosophy. And he was no slouch uh, as a writer or a speech giver. Now, the reason, another reason why you haven't noticed this before is that this is the way professionals look at editing. And amateurs don't look at a skill the same way professionals do. Um, the easiest example, and the one I enjoy giving most often, is the example that comes from the Karate Kid, where the Karate Kid wants to become a, uh, a great karate guy, and he goes to the expert, whom we all remember as Mr. Miyagi. And Mr. Miyagi finally agrees to teach him, and the kid goes to learn karate, and what Mr. Miyagi has him do doesn't look like karate. And the kid is upset. And he says, why am I waxing your car? And why the heck am I painting your fence? And Mr. Miyagi tells him, stick with those behaviors. He doesn't put it that way. He just says, wax on, wax off. Wax on, and you know the rest of it. He's saying, stick with those behaviors. And the Karate Kid is thinking, this doesn't make any sense. And yet the lovely um, result of this movie, as we see at the end of it, is that Mr. Miyagi knew what went into the art of karate. And Mr. Miyagi knew that the waxing motions and the painting motions were the habits that were underneath the high level skill of doing karate. So I'm telling you, it's very interesting. These habits are what is underneath the high level skill of achieving readability. Okay. Uh, speaking personally as a guy who discovered this a number of years ago and has devoted about two and a half decades to teaching it. Uh, I just love this fact. I think this is the most exciting fact going about language. Um, I love the fact that language with all its richness can still be understood by understanding five basic moves. Now, there's much more to this than this summary has uh, been able to deliver. As you can probably guess, 
There are very specific skills that are not that easy to do. For instance, learning to turn all to be verbs into active verbs is something that has to be practiced. I have seen college professors and professional editors who have trouble doing this, but you can learn to do it. One way you can learn to do it, if you want, is by uh, taking a look at my college writing guide. This is a textbook that summarizes the readability approach to writing. Uh, it's John McGuire's College Writing Guide, and you can find it on my website at readablewriting.com. If this uh, angle on writing uh, intrigues you, and you're thinking, how can I learn more about how to do this? How can I learn more about how to control these five variables? Um, you might look at this. My final point I want to make to anybody who's watching is to remind you that a simpler style is a better style. In high school, your teachers wanted you to learn those big vocabulary words and use them because A, they were assigned to do that, and B, they thought being able to handle big vocabulary shows that you're an educated person. But in fact, if you strive too hard to be impressive in your writing, and you pull in all these fancy words that you're not certain of the meaning of, you're going to end up looking like an awkward clown. The truth of the matter is, only the second rate try to be impressive in their writing. The second rate try to be impressive. The first rate writers aim at being clear. 